everyone, welcome. We'll get started here in just a few moments. I'm going to go ahead and dive in out of respect for everybody's time. We're glad you're with us today. My name is Lori Ward. I'm CEO of Washington's National Park Fund. Our mission is to raise and award philanthropic charitable dollars to Mount Rainier, North Cascades and Olympic National Parks. How we do things is the superintendents and their leadership teams give us their top priorities that otherwise would go unfunded at the beginning of the year. And we set out to raise the dollars throughout the year. I know many of you on the line today are very active supporters. and We are really grateful to you. Those of you who might consider, think about maybe a $10 a month gift. That's all I'll say on that. But we are grateful to everyone for your ongoing support. People often ask me, um, you know, which park is your favorite out of Mount Rainier, North Cascades and Olympic? And I, I love them all. I'm gonna share some of my favorite memories from North Cascades before we get started. That mountain over my shoulder, that's Mount Shuxon. And that's the first mountain I ever climbed, ever summited. It was very exciting, also very scary because that mountain at the top is, uh, is daunting, straight down the edge. Another great memory of mine was hiking with a circle of friends uh, for three days from Cascade Pass on down to Stahican and spending a couple nights in Stahican. That was a great experience. And then finally, one day I was, as I was training for the, um, the Shuxon climb, I was up by myself on 4th of July Pass up above Colonial Creek. And I came down and walked around a corner. And as I walked around the corner, there was a very large black bear. And he frightened me as much as I frightened him. And I heard him snort and he turned and ran away. And you know, it was, a, it was quite a memorable experience. I love North Cascades National Park. I'm excited to introduce you all today to Anthony, Anthony Killian. Anthony comes to us as a guide, a park ranger up at North Cascades. He comes from a small Midwestern town, uh, went to school with the, the dream of becoming a park ranger, park service employee. He's been with the park service uh, since 2015. And this summer he'll be starting his 15th, uh, or excuse me, his fifth summer up at North Cascades as an interpreter. So he knows the park pretty well. He's gonna share stories with us and uh, just some of his favorite experiences up at North Cascades. And with that, I turn it over to you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And thanks for the, the Washington National Park Fund putting these on. And it's really great to be out of my home working, as I'm sure many of you are right now. And, you know, even if it's over the computer online, do uh, an actual ranger program again. It's very exciting. Um, I've never done one over Zoom. So this is a brand new experience for me and I hope all of you, it looks like we have over 100 people online right now, uh, enjoy it and get something out of it. I'm going to throw up, um, since I can't actually take the computer into the park with me, I'm going to throw up a PowerPoint here with some images from inside the park to share with you. And hopefully we can all feel like we are out of whatever room or wherever we're, we're watching this, um, out in the great outdoors. The, the Cascades is a really uh, special park to me. It's one of the first places I ever worked. Uh, and it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pristine acres of designated wilderness. You don't have to hike for too far to kind of get away from it all and get out to a view like this one that you see on the screen in front of you, that's Cascade Pass, one of the more popular day hikes um, inside of the park. Uh, it's a really, really beautiful area. 
throughout our program today through zoom there are a couple of different functions we're going to use there will be a handful of times for the next 30 minutes or so that a poll will be thrown up on the screen that's that's about the easiest way i have to interact with you and there's also down at the bottom of your screen you might be able to see a, a question and answer box if there's any questions you want answered you're curious about anything feel free to type something out there uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to answer some of those questions by the time uh, we close down and end the program later today. I do want to explore the park as much as we can today. It's not the most well-known national park in Washington State. You know, it's not Mount Rainier or Olympic, uh, but it is a, a pretty incredible park and I'm really excited to share it with you. This place has a really exciting story that I'm, I'm fond of. It's near and dear to me because the Cascades was turned into a national park when a bunch of average everyday people who lived in the area fell hopelessly in love with the mountains here and they thought it was national park quality land and wanted to see it protected from uh, resource extraction. They, they thought that this should be a place where folks come to recreate and enjoy themselves. Uh, they, they banded together. There wasn't a, a President Roosevelt or a Rockefeller who donated land or decided it should be set aside and did it themselves. This really was a, an everyday person who, who stood up and, and said, I want this place to be a national park. It took a long time for that dream to become a reality. So hopefully uh, by the end of this, you have an appreciation for the, the genesis of this park and to show you, this is a map of North Cascades National Park Service Complex. I, I really wanted to start with this because like the name suggests, this is a complicated area. We are not just a national park. There are a couple of different types of park service sites here in the North Cascades that people can explore and experience. Starting from north to south, this blue area up at the top, this is our north unit of what we call the park proper, North Cascades National Park. Then this green, it's outlined in green here, this is Ross Lake National Recreation Area. This yellow star is one of our visitor centers, the North Cascades Visitor Center. And this red line is Highway 20 that cuts across the park. That is the only way somebody can drive across the park complex. Uh, and then further south, this blue area outlined in blue, this is the south unit of North Cascades National Park. A little red line coming in is part of Cascade River Road. The only place you can drive into North Cascades National Park is right here. Otherwise, the only way to access it is by hiking in on foot. Then the very tip of the park here, the southern end, this is the Lake Chelan National Recreation Area. This purple star is the Golden West Visitor Center in Stahican. And this is about a 20 some odd mile long road. Um, but the only way to get into the Lake Chelan Recreation Area is by either hiking in about 20 miles, uh, which I recommend, it's a pretty incredible hike, or by taking a ferry up Lake Chelan about three and a half hours on the boat to get there. It's a, it's a really remote community, but a really fascinating part of the park if, if you've ever been there before, or if uh, you ever want to visit in the future, I wouldn't miss that part of the park. Uh, definitely not the most visited area. Uh, before we go any farther, um, I'd like to ask and see out of all the people we have tuning in, how many of you have ever visited North Cascades National Park before, uh, the National Park Service Complex. There should be a poll up on the screen. Uh, we'll give it a moment. You can chime in and tell us whether or not you have ever visited us here in the North Cascades before in the past. Great. That's like third of us have not, but most of us who are tuning in have. Oh, cool. Um, that's great. Close that out. Um, and before we go on any further too, uh, we're also not going to talk about the past, the history of the park. I want to talk a little bit about the park's future and what it might hold. This really is a, 
a great forum, uh, th this piece of public lands to talk about the values we have surrounding wilderness, uh, the preservation of, of lands here in the Cascades and all across the country. Uh, but before we, we go in to talk about the park's future, I wanna look at the past because this is, is an old landscape. It's an exciting place. And for about 9,000 years, the people who called this mountain range home that you're looking at were the, the upper Skagit, the Soxwiatl, the Swinomish, the Nolkantma, Stolo peoples. Uh, for about 9,000 years, that's, that's the record we have of people who have called the Cascades home. And when America and Euro-American settlers were moving west, once they got to the coast of Washington and moved inland, they really stopped at the Cascades. This was not an easy landscape to travel through. Uh, it still isn't today. Highway 20, which is the northernmost route across the mountains, can't stay open during the winter times. We have to close it. Though well, still a tough place to travel into. Most of these settlers and pioneers came into the mountains, decided there wasn't much here, and they, they stayed down by the Puget Sound out of the mountains until the 1870s when somebody discovered gold in the Cascades and then all these settlers decided it's not that bad of a place to move into. Uh, if there's wealth up there, I want to find it and I can live uh, with this landscape. Um, I can live with trying to travel through something that's really difficult to live in. In addition to the physical resources of the park, of the Cascades, these people ran into a bunch of other really fascinating features in this area. The, the North Cascades, the National Park Complex, is home to about 312 glaciers. That's more than any other national park in the lower 48 states in the continental US. Uh, that's one of them you see there photographed uh, a few years ago now. Uh, we have quite a few of those and they're really important for all sorts of life in the park. The Skagit River, which, which runs through the heart of the complex, is home to all five species of Pacific salmon. You see a couple pink salmon there, the humpies in the river. They, they come all the way up to the dams on the river to spawn and reproduce. If you ever really want to impress somebody at a dinner party and you want to remember all five species of salmon that call the Skagit River home, if you look at your hand, five fingers, each finger corresponds with a species of salmon. Your thumb, thumb rhymes with chum, so your chum salmon. Your pointer finger is good for socking somebody in the eye, so that's the sockeye salmon. Your middle finger is the tallest, it's the king of your fingers, that's the king salmon. Your ring finger, you might wear a silver ring on it, so silver salmon. And of course your pinky finger is the pinks, the pink salmon there. In addition, to the wildlife found here the, and the glaciers, there are also just some really, really beautiful vistas. This is the, the Picket Range. If you've ever been to the visitor center by New Halem, you might have seen this view before. And the Pickets were one of the last areas in the lower 48 states to be surveyed, to be put on the map. It's a really formidable landscape there that kept people out for a long time and today it's it's a mecca for climbers and mountaineers looking at that you can see that it's probably a really fun place to go climbing and exploring this is one of the impediments to these euro-american settlers who wanted to move into the area that was a a tough obstacle to navigate there there weren't a lot of people going up and over the uh, the mountains there the pickets we're also home to bunch of threatened rare endangered species. You can see the wolverine there on the left, the northern spotted owl on the right. Uh, we have over 1600 different types of plants in the park, 75 species of mammal, over 200 species of bird. We're a really diverse park. A huge amount of plant and wildlife calls this place home. We're actually the second most biodiverse park in the entire National Park Service system. There's only one other Park Service unit with a greater array of plant and wildlife than we do. And there's another poll to throw up, some National Park trivia. If you can guess, or if you know which park is the most biodiverse in the entire system, I've given you a few choices. Uh, Olympic National Park here in Washington, the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina and Tennessee, Everglades down in Florida, Yellowstone uh, in the Rockies, 
or National Park of American Samoa. We do have National Park Service sites in American territories. So take a moment to mull those over and see if you know which national park has more plants and animals than we do here in the North Cascades. An Olympic was my guess when I first moved here. Uh, we had 30% of people guess that. Uh, but the answer is actually the Great Smoky Mountains uh, down there in the southeast. They have, I think it's just a few more species of grass than we do here in the Cascades. So they beat us, but not by too much. They are the most biodiverse unit in the entire system. Here's another picture of those pickets just from a, a different angle. Uh, and this place started out, uh, it wasn't a very contentious area. In, in America for a very long time. The, the United States Forest Service, which was created in 1905, uh, it absorbed the forests here in the Cascades. It became part of their domain. And they were tasked with managing the forests uh, as a crop, basically, that if we used scientific methods, we could grow these trees, we could take care of them in a sustainable way, that we could harvest them for building homes, buildings, everything else that you would need for American industry. Um, and they had this, this philosophy that they called multiple use. They, they wanted to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. But when they looked at a forest like here in the Cascades, they asked themselves, what resources are here that we can extract, whether it be timber or minerals or clearing land for grazing cattle? Um, or is this a good place for recreation? Should we build trails and campsites? Uh, should we have places designated for folks who wanna go skiing in the wintertime? They tried to balance all of these different needs on our public lands. In 1916, the Park Service was created. Uh, we're kind of um, a fraternal organization. We're similar to the Forest Service, but we're also different in a couple of notable ways. Our philosophy, is very preservation oriented. When we set aside some land as a national park or a memorial, we're not having people come in and graze their cattle on it. People aren't going to be chopping down the trees because they need to build homes. We're going to primarily have this land set aside for recreation, camping, fishing, uh, skiing. That's really popular in the Cascades in the wintertime, but we're not going to be developing the land and extracting stuff from it as often as the Forest Service. And these two agencies, the Forest Service and the Park Service, they, they competed with each other a lot. Uh, we didn't always get along so well. Both of us were fairly young agencies in the early part of the 20th century, and we were trying to establish ourselves and tell Congress we're, we're worthwhile, our budgets need to be bigger, you know, all that, all that good stuff and trying to control as much top tier public land as we can. And we both came to, to loggerheads with one another here in the Cascades because there are these huge old growth forests. It's green gold. The Forest Service was really excited to manage this area. But the Park Service looked at these mountains and there was even a Park Service director who looked at this view you're looking at right now and said, I want that. Um, so there was a lot of competition between the two agencies about how this land should best be managed and who should be in charge of managing it. And this is really where, where regular people come into the mix because it was the 1890s when there were some folks living in the area who decided this was national park material. Even before there was a national park service, there were people who thought this should be a park. Uh, they were kind of laughed at for a while, shouted down, folks who lived in the area said, we don't really want our forests locked up um, and kept away from development, from logging them. Uh, people like us with mining claims, we don't want to, to have to say goodbye to those. We still think there's a lot of gold in those hills that we want to extract. Um, and spoiler alert, there really wasn't a lot of gold in the Cascades. Nobody got rich mining up here. The, the land was just too fractured to extract a lot of resources from. It wasn't until the 1930s when the Park Service gave this area a really serious look. And it was a look that was serious enough that it really frightened 
the Forest Service. Uh, this is a really busy map on the screen. Uh, in the 30s, the Park Service did a survey of the Cascades in Washington State, uh, and they proposed, inter excuse me, internally, a, in a park they called Ice Peaks National Park. And looking at it, I'm no artist, but at the very top of the screen there, I've tried to outline the shape of the park today so you can get an idea of the scope of what the Park Service was aiming for in the 30s. This was over 5 million acres stretching from the border with Canada, including Mount Baker there, Mount Shuxon, uh, Stahican, Cascade Pass, down past Glacier Peak, over Snoqualmie Pass east of Seattle. We would have absorbed Mount Rainier National Park into this, this proposal. It goes all the way down almost to the Columbia River at Mount St. Helens and Mount, Mount Adams. This would have required the government to take about 5 million acres of forest land from the Forest Service and give it to the Park Service. So when the people in the Forest Service heard about this, they kind of lost their minds and the, the Secretary of Interior, the boss for the Park Service, he had to, to withdraw this and put it on a shelf and say, we weren't actually serious about this proposal. So this was a pretty short-lived idea, but I still like to share it with people. I like how ambitious it is and to imagine what a park on this scale would have been like. This would have been just a little bit smaller than um, Denali National Park is today. So for a long time, up until about the 50s, people were trying to decide here in the Cascades whether they think there should be a national park. Should we give up these lands, the resources in them for, for development to, to make them more recreational? Should people, when they come here, primarily be camping and hiking, uh, riding horses over passes, or should people be able to log should they be able to mine? Should we be clearing the land and trying to develop it for a growing country? People had really strong feelings about this. If you lived in a local community here, your livelihood likely depended upon the timber industry. It was really big at the time. So when you were asked, would you like to see a national park? It kind of felt like you were being asked, do you want to give up your job in the timber industry for a job that's more tourism based? Do you want your community to be a gateway community to a national park? And some people thought a park was a great idea. Some people, they really didn't like, like the idea of giving up their livelihoods and having to change jobs. The, the Forest Service had this philosophy about doing the greatest good for the greatest number. And the Park Service had a philosophy centered around whether or not something should be set aside just because it has aesthetic value. That there's something valuable in just having this land there to see and experience and hike in. So I believe we have another poll to throw up where you can think about if you were here um, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s when this, this controversy was going on and you'd had a decision to make, who would you have supported managing this land, whether the Forest Service sort of conservation model, where it's possible to balance the need for timber and the need to recreate, or a Park Service preservation model, that this place is so unique, it should stay untouched and available for people decades from now to enjoy as it is. So mull that over for a moment. When I'm doing this program in person, this is usually where we have some really good conversations with folks. I'm interested to see what people think. And not that I'm biased working for the Park Service, but it's like 90% of us thought that uh, we would have preferred Park Service management. That's really cool. It doesn't happen with every program I give. So thank you for, for participating in that and sharing your thoughts. I, I appreciate that. After the, the Second World War, this fight, this um, push for a park really picked up. We had all these GIs coming home. Uh, industry was booming especially around Seattle where Boeing had their factories set up 
there was a lot of disposable income. And on the weekends to get out of the cities, people started traveling into the North Cascades. And this we could consider really the second time people had discovered the North Cascades. They were going out on their weekends to get out of the city. Uh, they were camping, fishing, having a lot of fun out there. And folks really started falling in love with the Cascades. And one of the people who really fell head over heels hard for this place was a fellow named Grant McConnell. He had he fought in the Second World War. He was a college professor and he had a summer home in Stahican at the top of Lake Chelan. When he heard that there was a proposal to log near his home, he started contacting people he knew in the conservation movement to see if anything could be done to protect the Cascades. And this movement for a park really started to take off by that point. There were a lot of citizen groups involved with it. Um, by the late 50s, early 60s, there were the Mazamas, they're from Portland, the Mountaineers from Seattle, the Sierra Club from California, um, a regional group called the Federation of Western Outdoor Clubs, the Wilderness Society, and of course the North Cascades Conservation Council from here in Washington State. And all these groups, they were pretty local, homegrown, everyday people joined them, and they started to apply a lot of pressure to their legislators, the lawmakers in Washington, D.C., to create a park. Uh, and they started to get a lot of traction. The, the Forest Service was a little worried at this point, hearing so many people clamoring for a national park. One of the, the supervisors in the Mount Baker National Forest here, uh, a quote that I like, told his boss that the scenic values here in the Cascades are as high as for Mount Rainier or the Rockies and Glacier National Park. They should be adequately protected and a maximum number of recreational opportunity provided. We in the Forest Service are prone to belittle the scenic beauties in favor of timber production. I can see the point of climbers and outdoor people and although not agreeing with them, I can see the need for this kind of value assessment. If we do not assess the value of the scenery in these few areas, we will be legislated into doing so under another department. If we don't start taking recreation and preservation here seriously, pretty soon somebody in Congress is going to take away this national forest from us and give it to the, the National Park Service. Uh, a Wilderness Society publication at the same time, they sent a group into the Cascades, read, we found ourselves comparing each falls, each peak, each glacier, and each forested valley that we knew in this area with its counterpart in the national park system and concluded that here was grandeur, more dramatic, more unique, and more varied. Uh, there were a lot of people who had really strong feelings about the North Cascades and eventually Congress decided there should be a joint study between the Forest Service and the Park Service about what the best use of the Cascades was. The controversy had gotten big enough that senators and representatives were starting to listen a little bit more closely. There was a, a joint study that came up with this. This was their draft of what a national park here should look like. I've left that blue star on there showing the North Cascades Visitor Center by New Halem. And apart from that being outside of the park boundary, that looks really familiar and similar to what we have here in the Cascades today. They held hearings on this, about three of them throughout the 60s. One of the, the people who wrote in with their views was actually a soldier in Vietnam at the time. And he had wrote that uh, his pinups in his tent were not of women, but they were pictures of the North Cascades. And he would really appreciate it if Congress created a national park there in the Cascades. And then lo and behold, October 2nd, 1968, uh, decades after people first brought up the idea of a national park, uh, the North Cascades National Park Service Complex is created with those finalized boundaries that you see on the screen in front of you right now. That was a, a big victory for folks at the time. They, uh, they were really happy with, with the park being created, but it wasn't the end of the controversy because once the park was created, visitor centers have to go up, campgrounds have to be made, and people were worried that the Park Service was going to go overboard with the amount of development they were going to, to do here in the Cascades. And some of these earliest plans called for more roads, so a road going up the east side of Ross Lake to the border of Canada, uh, bigger campgrounds, more visitor centers, some restaurants, some hotels. And the most interesting part of these early development plans was a call for trams, little cable cars, 
that would take people up the sides of the mountains to views like this one that you see on your screen in front of you. Um, not exactly what many of these early park proponents had in mind. They really hoped this place would just stay as it is relatively untouched. Um, but as a public entity, uh, our, our job is to provide access to this park to all Americans, um, no matter where they're coming from and how comfortable they are with backpacking. This is public land that is set aside for them. I think we have another poll we can throw up. Um, if you were the director of the National Park Service at the time here in the, the early 70s now, would you have wanted to develop the Cascades and include things like more roads and tramways to take people to the tops of mountains? Um, yeah, national parks are for everybody, not just those able to hike to the top of a mountain. Access should be available via hiking, paddling, driving, riding in a tram, in accordance with our mission statement, which in part reads dedicated to conserving unimpaired the natural and cultural resources for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. Or if you were director, would you have opposed developing the park in this way? Because part of that mission statement isn't just to enjoy and educate people, it's to preserve it unimpaired. Um, how would you have balanced this need for access to the park and preserving such a phenomenal landscape? So take a moment to think about that and we'll see where everybody comes out on this, this topic. A little bit closer than the last one, about 60% of people would, would leave it as it is. Really cool. And that was a pretty big conversation at the time. Um, the, you know, folks I talk to in the park who come in with their, their toddlers, they might want to hike up to a place like this, but their, their three-year-old, their four-year-old can't quite make it. Um, so they would have liked to see trams, but other people come in and say, heck no, you know, I don't want to have cable cars running to the tops of mountains. I, I come here to, to explore this place and really test myself in a wilderness setting. Uh, and today we can't do a lot to change the way the park is. 94% uh, of it is now designated wilderness. It's pretty much going to stay as it is today, um, as you see it up there on the map. None of those, those boundaries are going to change. But we do have some challenges that are confronting us in the future. Kind of a, a big one is climate change as the earth is warming. Um, we're noticing some changes inside the park. Here we have the American pika, a member of the rabbit family they can't really survive at temperatures above something like 78 degrees. So as the earth gets warmer, their habitat is going to move further and further up in elevation. They're a good indicator species to see what kind of changes are happening in the park. Uh, we have our glaciers, 312 of them, like I said at the beginning. Uh, over the years, we have noticed them receding. Since 1900, we've lost about 53% of our glacial area. So if you took all the glaciers and spread them out over a flat surface, about half of that has disappeared in the last 120 years. Uh, marmots, this is really interesting and fairly new. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a 69% reduction in marmot populations in the park. We're studying to find out why that is. Now, it's possible that as the high country is thawing out earlier in the year while they're still hibernating, they become exposed and predators can get an easy snack as they, they head up to higher elevations. Um, so that's something that the park and research partners are studying to learn more about. And, and something else that's interesting to think about is uh, our visitors. We're, we're a fairly low visited park. The, the park proper receives 30 to 40,000 visitors a year. The highway gets about a million people per year. Um, but with all of these people coming into a concentrated area, is that hurting the resource? Uh, in the 60s, the Atlantic Magazine wrote that uh, the Cascades' inaccessibility had been their salvation. That time is past. As more people discover the North Cascades again, a lot of them through geotags on, on social media sites where you can see where pictures were taken, some fragile ecosystems can be affected by all that increased foot traffic. So is that a threat, something that we're going to have to manage differently in the future, even having visitors come into the park? Um, here, Fisher Basin, this is one of my favorite areas in the park, 
1967, the last grizzly bear in the Cascades was, was killed in this basin before we became a national park. And today the Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service are looking at restoring grizzly bears to the Cascades. There's anywhere from you know, one to 10 grizzlies in the, in the Cascades, it's not many. And this being public land, you know, people have to have their say. Is this a place where folks think that the North Cascades, is this a place where people want to see the grizzly bear restored? The, the bear's numbers are dwindling. Should we as a society decide to bring the bear back? Um, last year, there was a comment period on whether or not people would want to see the bear restored, how they'd want to see the bear restored. That environmental impact statement is being reviewed by the Department of Interior right now. I don't have any fresh information on, on when a decision could be made, but being public land and everybody across the country having a say, it's going to be interesting to see what the decision is once we get out on the other side of it and what happens to this charismatic animal in the North Cascades. That's kind of the, the end of my, of my presentation. If there's a question that wasn't answered, or in the future, you, you have more questions. That's some, those are a couple good ways to get in contact with the park. Uh, we're happy to answer your questions as best we can, but I'm, I'm glad you all could join me for this little dive into the Cascades. That's a, a shortened history of the parks of the park here. Uh, and I'm happy if Lori has anything to say to, to answer a few questions. Well, we all love listening to rangers there's just something about it you know and um you did a great job today a few things that stand out for me the glacier photos are striking yeah and then also i like the the king the the pink the way the silver i thought that was really creative good way to remember things i do have a series of questions you ready to fly through them oh yeah yeah okay first off any idea when the park will open this season Yes, that's a very popular question. Yes. Um, so the, the health and safety of the visitors, the people who work here, um, volunteers who come in to help out, it's a pretty high priority for the, the park management, the people several pay grades above me. Uh, we're working with guidance from the White House, the Centers for Disease Control and local health authorities to gradually increase access to the park. Um, we're looking at every facility and service we provide to see what we can do for employees and visitors to ensure we're complying with the current guidance from these health authorities. So while I don't have a, a specific date, um, we do know that we're working to open it as soon as we can. And uh, our, our Facebook and our website are gonna be two of the best places to get the most up-to-date information on what that decision is. Thank you, Anthony. Your nephews? They want to know what's the most startling encounter you have had with wildlife. Mm. My very, I think it was my very first week here in 2016. I was driving home one night from getting groceries and this animal ran across the road in front of me. I thought that was a really big dog and then I stopped and turned around and it was a, it was a mountain lion that had run right in front of my car. Uh, I didn't hit it, thank goodness, but uh, I've never seen one before. I've never seen one since. It's the only time I've seen one in the wild. That was pretty startling and, and really cool. Just, I think my first week here to, to see something like that, just wow. a few feet for me. I bet. I bet that was exciting. Do bears and cougars or any wildlife pose threat to backpackers and or day hikers? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, every wild animal, I mean, it could be a threat. They're they're trying to survive out there just like we are. Uh, in, in my experience and what I know is a bear especially, it becomes a hazard if it's been habituated. If people have been feeding it, it knows that humans are a source of food. If you have Cheetos or Oreos on you or something like that, um, or if you startle them, uh, they don't like to be startled. But making noise on the trail they don't want to be around you just like you don't want to be around them. Um, I've, I've hiked a bunch of places in the park. I have never come around the corner of a trail and, and been faced with a, a bear or a, a cougar. They, uh, I make a lot of noise when I walk. I'm a loud person, but they, they tend to stay out of your way if, if they know you're in the area. Thank you. Um, there is a photo of Cascade Pass in the presentation. Yes. Do you, um, 
know what time of year that photo was taken? That was early to mid-July, I believe, two years ago when that was taken. Great. What do you think is the most common animal found in the park? Um, I, slugs are pretty common walking around. I see a lot of slugs, especially this time of year. They're starting to, to emerge from, from where they've spent the winter. Um, songbirds especially, a lot of varied thrush you run across in the park. And then of course deer, lots of deer uh, all over the place. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Tell us about native wildlife restoration successes. Native uh, wildlife, yeah. Good yeah, the, uh, the best example I can think of that um, I believe is mostly wrapped up We've been restoring uh, fishers. It's a, yeah. it's a member of the weasel family related, related to the wolverine. We've released quite a few of them in the Cascades, even the South Cascades around Rainier and out on the Olympic Peninsula. I believe you've had more, at least one presentation on the fisher restoration here. And they've, um, they've taken off. The habitat was intact. They just weren't here to use it. So everything was right to bring them back. And as far as I know, that's been it's been a pretty good success so far. That's quite a story. It we is. love supporting that project. James, age five, wants to know, what is the life cycle of a glacier? Life cycle of a glacier? Yeah, well, during the winter, um, as it snows, that snow piles up, compacts under the weight of it, turns it to ice, and that's how a, a glacier grows. And it takes a very long time to create a glacier. They don't happen overnight or over the course of just a couple of winters. Over the course of a year, as temperatures warm up and they melt, they shrink, they get larger in the winters, and as this process repeats itself over years and years and years, it either gets bigger or smaller. And right now, there's more of that ice melting in the summers than is being replenished in the winter, so we know those glaciers are receding on our mountains here in the Cascades. Good answer, thank you. What's the highest elevation in the park and how high have you been able to get up, Anthony? Oh, I know the highest point in the park is um, Mount Good or, or Goody, I hear some people say it. Uh, that's 9,220 feet. That's the highest point in the park. I have no idea where the highest point I've been is in the park. Probably not as high as it might say that it is. Um, I'm sure going like over Rainbow Pass, which is a few thousand feet, it's probably the highest I've been. That's cool. And a lot of folks think that Mount Baker is in the North Cascades National Park Complex and it's not. It's outside. It's in the forest. Mount yeah, that Baker. was one of those political negotiations when the park was being created was who would get Mount Baker, the Forest Service or the Park Service? And it stayed with the Forest Service. We have just another minute. What's your favorite animal or plant in the park? Mm. My favorite animal is the mountain goat. Um, I like to go up and, and watch those in the summertime when I can. They're really fun animals to watch. That's neat. And just last week, our webinar, the virtual field trip, was on the transporting of the mountain goats from Olympic to the North Cascades. So folks, if you didn't see it, it's well worth tuning in um, and watching that from last week. That was great. Uh, let's see. Someone's heading up to Sahali Glacier Campground. Any suggestions on other must-see areas? What are the top three to four um, trails, in your opinion? Sahali is a really, really gorgeous part of the park. Um, definitely one of the more popular areas people go. I really like Easy Pass, so that, that last picture I showed of Fisher Basin, that's one of my favorite areas in the park. I think that's an incredible place to go if you have the chance. Um, over um, by McAllister Pass near Stahican, that's a really cool area. I like hiking through there. Um, and Sourdough Mountain is a pretty, pretty phenomenal area. Some good wildflowers up there once you get out of the trees, but it's a killer of a hike, that's for sure. Another minute. Um... Will this be available for later viewing? Yes, we are recording and we post this up on our website. So go to wnpf.org and you'll find it. Just do a quick search. Uh, let's see. 
I think that just about wraps it up. Um, a, a relative up in Canada says it's good to meet you, Anthony. I'm the last surviving Killian in Canada, so that's kind of fun. Um, I think with that, we will close things down. I just really, we're all really grateful that you all who joined in today are so interested in learning more. I was surprised to see the number that haven't been. And I guarantee you, when you drive up and over Washington Pass for the first time, you'll be absolutely stunned by the beauty that you see and experience. So um, take time, get up to the North Cascades this summer. Huge thanks to you, Anthony. Um, you did a great job. Rangers are just so fun to listen to. And you really did a great job today. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Stay well. Be hopeful. The light shines ahead. So uh, be in touch. Take care.